um, we have become servants of the system instead of servants of God. And that's the real problem is, is that Christianity has become an entity in itself apart from Christ. There are churches that God's presence left years ago and they are still functioning just like they did and have always functioned. Now how does that work? You know, how can, how can anything that is called the church truly be the church without Christ? And the truth is it cannot. It cannot. And so there has been developed a system, and it is a religious system based on certain things. This is acceptable. This is what you do. This is how you do it. And anything short of that, and let me tell you something right now. If John the Baptist showed up right now today, and we'd never heard of John the Baptist, if some guy was out here preaching out here in the fields, and he was wearing woolly skins and eating locusts, you know, we'd be freaking out and saying, this guy is off. Huh? And yet, man, he was the only, he's been had a prophet in 400 years till John showed up. They wouldn't know what a prophet looked like. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, they wouldn't have any clue what a prophet looked like. And when one showed up, they didn't, they missed it. You know? Because we have these preconceived ideas of how everything's supposed to be done. And so if you don't fit in the in the mold and you don't fit in everything, then there's something wrong with you. And then, you know, the common term is, uh, well, you're a cult. And, you know, the uh, I, I, I think of, there's so much that I think of in this, but the, one of the main things I think of is, is just simply the founding of this country. What founded this country? Well, I'll tell you what founded this country. There was... The, the Catholic Church ruled everything and it ruled England. And finally there was a king who said, we are going to break from the Catholic Church. And we're going to be the Church of England. And we're not going to have a Pope and we're not going to have all this, uh, the way that they do everything. And, um, but the king was actually over the church then. And so there came a couple of groups that separated from that. Some of them called separatism. Others, um, wanted to purify the Church of England of all vestiges of the Catholic Church. And so they became known as you know, Puritans. Isn't that interesting? Is that the term you've always used for Puritans and what you thought that meant? You know? Well, they were just trying to make the, the Church of England pure of all Catholic influence and whatever. And it was not pure of that, and some of the separatist groups uh, wanted to break from uh, all of the, the ways that they were doing it. They wanted to, everybody to have their own Bible and for God to be the authority over the church. And, you know, not in the sense that they were leaders, but in the sense that they didn't answer ultimately to any man. Uh, the whole church answered to God. And things like that. And so they separated, and they looked like, you know, the Church of England, when they split from the Catholic Church, looked like a cult. Amen? And the separatists and Puritans, when they separated from the Church of England, looked like a cult. Amen? And so they moved to Holland, and they tried to live there, and all the Dutch kids were wild and everything. It was influencing their kids, and they said, man, you know, we can't live here. We, we, we want a place that's an environment for the Lord. So they heard about this place called the New World. And they got in boats... And the first set of boats that came over were what? The Mayflower, Nina, Pinta, and the Santa Maria, you know, all those <laughs> They got in the Mayflower, and they sailed over here, and that was the beginning of the U.S. in a major way, and it was cultish people wanting an environment for the Word and the Lord and for their children. That's, that's where this nation came from. And the people that came over here, that first group, half of them died the first winter. But they came for religious freedom and to be able to worship the Lord they wanted to. Well, folks, all we're doing is saying the same thing. That the Word of God is true. Uh, that we, we believe in the Lord. We want Jesus the head of the church. And we're just standing up. But now America says... Well, that's cultish. You, you need to have a denomination, and you need to look a certain way, and you need to be a certain way. You're not. 
And nothing that ever, you know, there will always be a stiffening and a stifling of, of religion. And there will always be a break with that. And that break will always look negative at first. But it's not negative, it's the Lord. And it comes out of life and it comes out of the truth working in people. So anyway, the ministers here, they had job descriptions, they had they had fit into the system so well that they were able to easily just walk by need or walk by stuff like that and, and not affect them. Amen? And the Samaritan, he was different. So we know, uh, I just read that we no longer serve him, but do and are motivated to do whatever it takes to maintain the system. So let me say, whoever's a leader on any level in this place, we have, you can form all of this into a system, but it's not meant to be a system. It's meant to flow by life. Okay? And you, you, on the other hand, can be an accuser of somebody who is flowing by life, but they're, they're, they see beyond the natural, and they're flowing with the spirit, and say you're just flowing with the system. And they're not. The goal is for all of us to see Jesus. All the body receiving nourishment from the head. No time can be given to God or to, uh, to spontaneous breaks in the routine. And this is one reason why Deb's having the class that she's having. Because it is a spontaneous break with what's normal and stuff like that. And sometimes you just have to do it. It just helps. I remember... Uh, a couple of years back, we decided to just start having class outside in that patio. And so I started teaching a class out there. <clears throat> right now, the mosquitoes are pretty bad. So. Uh, you have become a professional minister when the doctrines and creeds of the group you are, uh, you are with become more important than the Word of God. <clears throat> you have become a professional minister when your primary duty is that of leading people instead of serving people. Listen carefully. If your primary thing is leading people instead of serving people, now listen. If your primary thing, this is what's gotten you, is leading people instead of serving people, then eventually people who will not follow you, you will dominate them. Because why? Your primary call or thing that you think is leading people, I'm trying to lead you people, you won't lead, you'll start dominating them to to put them in a position where they will have to follow you. But when you're serving people, guess what? When you're serving people, people won't always follow you. They won't always do exactly what you want. Did you know that? And of course, as a leader, you're supposed to go, <coughs> why don't you do what I want? I'm the leader. As if that makes any difference at all. I mean, really, it don't make any difference. What, you know, got a badge? You know, you got something to, you know, see, I'm the leader, she is supposed to, you know. I mean, even a policeman can stand there, you can be driving with a car, and he can stand in the middle of the street with a badge and a gun on his hip and go, and a whistle, and, go, and you can plow him down. That badge didn't stop anybody. Huh? Now, God may use power on you with you if you start plowing over his, his, you know, servants and stuff like that. He may pull out a gun in the rear a couple of times. <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, you don't, you know, you're not, um, this, this isn't, in one sense, this isn't even about getting somewhere. It's about being something. And if the whole thing won't go right, you can still be the Lamb of God. You can still let Christ live in you. Did you know that? And that can bring more glory to God than if you got everything to some location or did some accomplish something. That's, that means almost nothing to, to God compared to receiving His Son, the life of His Son, the Spirit of His Son. And so I believe the Lord intentionally breaks the stuff down all the time. I mean, I really believe that. I expect it normally uh, for things to flow smoothly. I, I don't expect that very often. I expect there to be... Problem people, problem situations, problems with me. And I expect to come to the image of Christ in the midst of all of that with nothing changing. Now that's what I expect. 
you know. That's my greatest desire, as a matter of fact. And so, now that wasn't always the case. At one time I thought, man, this is all about getting stuff done and making things happen and this and that and whatever. And, and so it was, you know, man, you just live frustrated all the time. And it, it would seem like just about the time when you get everybody on the same page and moving together that something happens and all breaks down. And you just want to go walk over in the corner and go, why can't this work? Why won't you people do right? You know, and of course, I can hear the Spirit of the Lord whispering in my ear, why won't you be Christ-like? Why won't you let my Spirit fill you? Because of these people. <laughs> yeah. And there's that again, pointing, amen. Pointing at something else, using anything as an excuse, but instead of saying, "Hey," you know. And you look at a good example of a real good leader is Moses. Look at this man in the wilderness. My God, these people murmured constantly. They didn't just murmur; they murmured at him all the time, all the time. They were always against him. Now I don't, I can't really find any major things that Moses did wrong as a leader. I mean, he seemed like a pretty, pretty good guy. Amen. Do most of you kind of, I mean, you don't, you don't see him you know, walking around getting drunk or you know wandering off, coming back three or four months later, go, oh, okay, sorry. You know, I mean, basically, he was a faithful, godly man who went after the Lord, and people were always chewing on him. And every time something would happen, what was his reaction? Some of them. He'd fall on his face before God. And go, oh, God. And he'd pray for the people, not, oh, kill them, Lord. He never prayed like that. He said, oh, Lord, help them. And Lord, this is, you know. I remember one time he got real frustrated, you know, and he said, it was a great conversation. I can't remember. It's probably Exodus 33 in there somewhere, 32, 33, right in there somewhere. Great conversation. You should look it up and find it. He's, he's talking to God and he's real frustrated. He goes, Lord, your people won't do so and so and they don't do this. And God speaks back to him and says, Moses, your people need to da 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 da. And if you don't watch it, you'll miss it. They both keep calling your people. <laughs> I'm thinking, whoa, the Lord's in a, he turned the tables on. Hey, these are your people. This is your family. This is your call, baby. You know? And that's, that's the father. He's, he is not first trying to shape up the people. He's got somebody right there in face to face with him, and he's trying to bring something closer and closer and closer to him. And it was Moses. Amen? Yeah. And, and that's what he's trying to do to you. It's exactly what he's trying to do. So, you know, you look at this stuff, and, and, I, and I, know the, I know that sense of anticipation. Oh, my God. Things are getting better. Things are doing better. Things are going to be better. Things are going to be better. The way I know that is I see several signs outwardly. Well, first of all, you ain't much of a leader. You're led by appearances. Amen? I mean, a true leader needs to be able to see into the Spirit. Needs to be able to see the heart of the Lord. Needs to be able to hear the direction of the Holy Spirit. And not be influenced by that. I mean, oh, this is this is so exciting because it looks so good. I have learned as a leader not to get very excited about anything that looks good, and not to get too discouraged about anything that looks too bad. Something I've learned: things aren't as good as they appear when they're going good, and they're never as bad as they appear when they're going bad. Okay? If you can get that in you, it'll help. You. Yeah, because when things seem so bad, something kicks in and go, it, it looks bad, but things are not as bad as they appear. Okay? But the other thing is, forget appearances. Forget the appearances at all. And a lot of times I do, man, I mean, stuff starts happening good and stuff like that, and I just try to just be steady with the Lord, steady in the Spirit. I try not to go, you know, this is big. You know what? Because too many times when it just starts going really good, it all seems to break down. And you go, and my reaction when I'm going by the circumstances is, man, Lord, I mean, you're just about the time. I, wait a minute. This happens too often. You got something to do with this. This ain't all the devil. This is too big. You're doing something here. 
And, you know, you either conclude that he's a bad God, but, you know, we know he's good all the time. But it depends on what good is. Yeah. And so you find out, you know, you're either, you're either a bad God or you're, and this is what I literally came to, literally, all by myself with the feeling of God, or you're after something other than these things that I've been working and pushing so hard. I thought it was this, and it's always something you can almost put your arms around. And I ain't talking about that sweetheart here. Well, maybe I am. You always think it's something like that. But no, no. God is after first a work in you. When he gets a work in you, then he can work through you. If he can't get a work in you, if, he, if you're not the work of God, forget it. He can't use you. I mean, you'll go off on your own. You'll go off on, on bad feelings and hurt stuff. And you'll go off on, on how good everything is and and, and I, you know, I'll just tell you another thing. A lot of times when things are really good, it's not as good as it appears to the enemy as it were. I'm just, you know, and I'm not saying everything, but I'm saying a lot of times. I remember, I can look back over the, the life of this church, not counting, just all the ministry, and I know some of the worst times happened right after what was considered a really good time. During that good time, the enemy was able to sneak in and do all sorts of stuff. And so I learned, that, you know, the scriptures say don't call good evil and evil good. Well, it doesn't mean don't call good times evil and bad times good. The cross did not look good, but it was the best thing that ever happened. Yes. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so you're going to have to, to even fulfill that scripture, you're going to have to have more spiritual eyes than what you have, calling good good when good may be evil in the sense that man the enemy's using that and he's bringing you know it's, it looks like a good time oh look at all the people that are coming and look at all the great things that are going on and man he's got plans he's bringing in and, you know and this person's going to cause this three months from now and this is going to happen six months from now it's all going to blow up in your face trust me that just walk faithfully with the lord every day and don't worry about what's going on and stuff bad stuff's going to happen bad stuff is going to happen but Jesus is still the most wonderful thing you'll ever have. I mean, that's really the deal. I mean, nothing out here can take away this wonderful thing you have with the Lord if you've got something with the Lord. If you ain't got nothing with the Lord, you're willing to give it up for, uh, you know, what was it? Pottage or whatever it was that uh, Esau gave it up for him? Pot of soup, you know? If you got something with the Lord, you realize these people can't take this they can't even touch it. And you just keep walking with the Lord. It's like, you know, David said, and he was a, David was a heck of a leader because he was plugged into the Lord. Made major mistakes, sins, messed up, didn't he? Well, bless God, if he messed up, failed, and sinned, and just did all this stuff, then he's not a good leader. He's one of the best leaders there ever was in the Bible. Why? Because he had a heart after God. He kept that heart after God. And so David's, David's basic attitude was, well, though the mountains fall into the sea, and though the you know, storms come and all this kind of stuff, man, I love you, Lord. I'm with you, Lord. I'm following you, Lord. Paul said, nakedness, peril, tribulation, nothing will separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, and I've said a million times in conferences, then we start going through nakedness where we don't have any clothes and we don't have any, we go through peril where, you know, we're being attacked or even fear for our life on some level, and we begin to doubt if God loves us. It's just a scripture to us most of the time. Nakedness, peril, it's, it's fun to quote and especially to shout during the service. But the deal is, when I don't have provision, and when I am in peril in some manner, Nothing has separated me from his love. I am not separated. This doesn't prove I'm separated. See, and we let that be the proof that I'm separated. I mean, I'm, you know, if I'm going through this stuff, where's God? I hear people say that. Where's God? Well, he's right here. He's right here inside of me. Yes. And I don't know where he is in your life, but he's right here in me, and he's the most wonderful thing that ever happened in my life, even in the midst of
stuff is. You know, I'm writing on a little article right now. I mean, that, you know, many of you are familiar with the scripture where it says one thing about desire, you know, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to see the beauty of the Lord. In that same deal, he talks about his enemies coming against him and seeking to destroy him and everything. And he goes, you know, all this stuff's going wrong and the, all these bad things are going on around me. And one thing about desire, get me out of this. No, that's not what he says. That's what we say. He's going, look, I only want one thing. If I can be in the presence of the Lord, seeing the Lord, beholding His beauty, this stuff doesn't mean anything. Amen? It's when you're not beholding the beauty of the Lord that all this really bugs you, and then you start looking for answers out instead of being a bright and shining light in that. You know, I'll tell you what, man. You know, to know that to, to be in a deep, dark place and to have light in that dark place is a tremendous thing. And when nobody else, if there's others with you in that deep, dark place and they don't have light, it's a tremendous thing for you to bring light into that place. And some will see the light and some will remain in darkness and attack the light and say, well, if your God is God, why doesn't he fix this situation? And I say, my God is God. And he's fixing more than situations. He's fixing me. And he's fixing this person here. And he's fixing this one here. And all of you are is darkness that would attack the light. But I'm telling you, he's bright. And he's bringing health and healing and victory and deliverance on levels I can't even describe to you. Well, you're just an idiot. Look how bad everything is. And I'm God to you. I'll be a fool for Christ because I am convinced God is good. <gasps> how could you say that? It's easy. But how do, you, how do you convince darkness? How does light convince darkness? It has no communion. There is no communion. There is no... So, so instead of going, oh my God, he shut me down. I mean, if God were here, we're, why would he bring it everything? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, because a whole lot of these people probably wouldn't have received light if it hadn't been so dark. You know? But because it's so dark, now they've seen the light. Now they recognize it. When it's all over with, we ain't going to dwell in darkness forever. That situation isn't going to be forever. It's not about the moment. It's about the eternal life that we have in the moment. Do we have eternal life in the moment, or do we have a, a temporal God who's always having to reach down in our moments? You know, and that's what they're saying. Where is the temporal God that reaches down in this moment? I said, well, I'm not sure where that one is. That's not the one I serve. <laughs> yeah. you know, but the eternal God is right here. And he's calling to you. And he's saying, you want peace? You want life? You want life? You want to be free from your hatred and your anger and, and your frustration over the situation? Then come to this eternal life and be made free. Mm -hmm. Dang, you got nothing to offer. Your God stinks. He's done nothing for us. Look at that. Somebody, look what so and so's going through. God, if, if, if God is allowing it, God's trying to bring them to Him. If the devil's doing it, the devil do everything he can to destroy a person. These, may not, these things may not mean much to you sitting in this classroom. <laughs> I'll tell you what. There is dark places a person can be sent to. There are dark, deep prisons and dungeons that are not man-made that you can be sent to that are tough. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'll just tell you another little thing along that line. I guess maybe because the Lord wants me to. But you know, most people really do play at Christianity. But I have looked into the face of the devil himself. I have looked into the face of darkness. I have seen the, the poison of asps experienced it. I have seen the vileness of the dark, you know, the Star Wars movie, the dark side, not the fun movie, the dark side, the darkness that is so intent on destroying Jesus that has no other thought. It can't even think of anything but destroy the light, destroy the light. It hates. And it hunts the precious soul. And I've 
seen it in, in armor. I've seen it in power. I've seen it, like David said, I've seen it great swelling and filling like a great tree vaunting itself when you have no power against it. I've seen, I've seen just, I've seen it face to face. And it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. And it is the real deal when it comes to life and darkness. It's the real deal when it comes to life and darkness. Christ is the light. And where He is and He burns brightly, there is hatred that you can't even imagine. I'm not talking about people mouthing off to you at work that you're a Christian. I'm not talking about that kind of persecution. That's not persecution. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not. It is, but it's not. You don't know the intent and the intended plan of the enemy to destroy darkness, and it has been practicing for 2,000 years. It knows exactly how to move, what to say, how to, all the things to work and whatever. And a person that has not walked into this light, so much so that, as it were, they were diffused, and now you don't see that person. Only the light, only Christ is begun to be seen. Only Christ begins to be seen. And, and that person, of course, man, you just get where all you want is Jesus. You have no desire for your little, you, you forget your little, what you want. You don't, there's nothing that you can set on the table that you want. But Christ, one thing have I desire. That will I seek after. Not against my enemy, not this or that but that I may be so blended into Him that I am hid, that I am lost. But, as, but the more you do that, the more you truly, and I'm talking truly, I'm not talking theologically, I'm talking truly, the more you do that, this true darkness, I'm not talking about the darkness of sinners walking around, or I'm talking about the total plan of principalities, powers, Mights, dominions that has one deal. It's not against Christianity. It's helping Christianity to flourish. It's against the living Christ. It's against the seed coming forth, and it's a great red dragon alone that comes after that. Not little bald demons or little hairy ones. The great red dragon himself with all of his fury, all of his mind, all of his might, all of his soul, all of his strength, focused at that woman in heaven, as it were, bringing forth a heavenly seed that he cannot stand. And he's intent for that. Now, if, you're, if that seed is coming forth in you, then let me just say this, you know. You better double check. <laughs> you better double check. Because the scriptures that talk about the, the poison of Aston, I mean, it goes over and over and over. You ought to just listen to David. David's not messing around. He's not, I mean, he has gone into the valley of the shadow of death, and all he had was thou art with me. There's some adjusting that takes place in you in the valley of the shadow of death where you, you, reach for, you reach for something you thought was good and it seems to be darkness. It seems to be, I mean, and compared to the light, it does not stabilize you. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, seems, it seems so Christian before. It seems so powerful before or so right before, but it means nothing. And you lay hold of something that is firm and powerful and steady. And then, storm comes. I mean, just like that. I mean, you, you, you read these 
books of people being beaten and being tortured over and over. That's just a physical manifestation of the spiritual truth. Just bam, 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 bam. And your body just wants to cry out. Your spirit cries out. Everything within you cries out that I may see you, that I may behold your beauty. I have nothing else except I see you. I will perish. And you will. You better believe you will perish. You will not hold up. You won't. You're, you were darkness. Now you lie only in the light. And he becomes so real to you. And you separate to him. And it's like leaving the earth. It's like leaving. It's like you're here, but you're not here. It's like the ups and downs of this life doesn't mean what it meant before. It's like you, you, you see through everything. Do you understand what I mean? You see through it. You, you don't see things. and You see through everything. And if it's not just absolutely this, the light of the world, the light of life, the, the word of life, the living Christ, you're not all excited about it. It can jump and shout Jesus all it wants to. And if it's not, if it's not that stability of the rock himself, you know the difference. You know it's just like, it, how do you describe it? It means nothing. And yet everybody says, oh, look, this is so much the Lord. And you're going, that's, that's not the Lord, the Lord. You put that under the anvil of this thing, and it'll just, I mean, it does. It just, it just fizzles and quickly fizzle so quickly but his life you know God you just go thank you Jesus every day for your life and, and it's not your doctrine it's everything he is everything to you and you know you know that there is nothing else that you have whom have I that I desire on earth. You just really find yourself, you know, you, and this is a dumb example, but you know, you hear these stories of people dying and they say they, they went up and you kind of in the corner and they could see their body and everybody in the room. In a certain sense, I don't know if it's dumb to put it this way, but in a certain sense, it feels like that, that you're not even here. You're more separated from here than you are here. That's why, you know, it's almost like this is, I can't explain that this is like, this is not the real. I mean, daily, moment by moment, this is not the real. You're, you're like really separated under the Lord, but not like you're something special separated under the Lord, like you're lost in the Lord. You see? Because the only hope is the armor of light that covers you, that is Christ, that is light to this dark angel. Angel. Turn to darkness and turn against the Lamb of God. And how can I describe? If I can't describe the Lord, I can't even describe to you the darkness and the depth of that. And most Christians don't even experience that. They're not. That's not what they're going through. They're going through their flesh and what they're trying to get over, or they're being attacked. A few demons hit them on a certain level of this and that. But they have never experienced, as it were, the great red dragon that has one intention and has at its disposal, oh, so many weapons that work in this earth. Oh, they work. They are tried and true. And men fall for them over and over and over. And the devil can depend on it because he knows man and what is in man. He knows them and he knows all I gotta do is pull out these guns and boom, I got what I want and they're going to they're they're gonna go with this thing and it's it's gonna sweep everything. It's like remember the great red dragon that just flood came out of his mouth and everything? And so so I just, you know, in closing, I'm just gonna say, man, let me tell you, this is this is not 
what reminded me of it just recently is I went and saw a movie, which I, I hate Vietnam movies because I was in the Army during Vietnam and I was a medic and, you know, I got a little bit of history there. I was a sergeant and had some men die and stuff like that. But I ended up going and seeing this movie and I just, the war was just a horrible war. There was this constant just clash and just massive death on both sides. And the enemy was unrelenting. And I just thought, man, Vietnam was nothing. How many people have survived this, this onslaught? I mean, generals that we have and don't even know it that are out here. That, that, that the church has marked off. And trust me, let me tell you something. The, the church that mainly knew Watchman Nee turned their back on him. In his lifetime, he was an outcast, and he was, they set him up in front of his church members, and they came up, and they railed on him and said, why did you teach lies to us? Not the message of Christ and him crucified. Why did you do this? And every one of them did it to save their skin. He went to prison for 20 years and never saw his wife again and never saw anybody else. Jesse Penn Lewis to this day is hated by a lot of people. More than they love her, they are she's hating. And if anybody ever read a book by Jesse Penn Lewis, my goodness, the life, the, the, the touch, the reality of the Lord. But man, they, the devil didn't just slam her then. Slamming and slamming, and that's what he did. Just, and then you just keep slamming and slamming and slamming and slamming and slamming. You, you know, and then you tell, and that's the, that's the enemy, that's torture. That's all men that torture people get it from the enemy. The enemy is the father of it all. He just slams you until he brings you to your knees, and then keeps slamming you until you cry out for mercy. But only, and, but, but then you read of, of others in the same boat who. See the Lord. You go deeper. <laughs> who, who, who literally come out of horrible things like that and say, Oh, how glorious is my Jesus. That, that love Him more deeply than you could ever imagine. That I saw that slight glow in the face of the humans. They can be killed. For their belief. And because of it, they have grown their roots and grown deep into the earth. But it's not just Christians under communist rule. That's why I said I saw it slightly. It is the seed, the seed of God that the enemy will hurl all his forces. So, you know, say language must be Christians. Let me tell you something. The things that you learn of the Lord, not in your head, the, how do you describe it? The stability that comes. We're not blown to and fro constantly. You know who you have believed. You don't know what you believe. You know whom you have believed. You know, Paul said, I know who, not what. He didn't believe stuff. He, he knew this whom. Paul, my God, even the church was against him constantly. And yet, look at the man. He knew the Lord. And he changed lives. And he made an eternal difference that is reverberating 2,000 years later right to this age right now. To us, to you. It's touching you. And so we say, well, yeah, I want to be a leader. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I'd like to be a big hotshot leader and stand out in front of people. You sure? I would I figure probably if I had to do it over again and consider the things, and it's not even true yet, I'm just figuring this out, you know. I might say no. But when I 
can look into the see the beauty of the Lord, then I, I I'm okay. I just go, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I throw my arms around His feet, and I don't ever want to leave that place. Mary had chosen that one day. Some of you are starting to see the Lord. What that means is the true and living seed is going to be in you. And the great red dragon is no respecter of persons. He doesn't see you. He's going to see Jesus. He's not going to see the Jesus in the Christian heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's going to see the seed, the thing that brings forth. Not, just, not the thing that, you know, we got millions in this country, millions of Christians, and this country's going to hell in the handbag. It's not making any difference. It's not seed that's sprouting up everywhere. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the seed which is Christ, not Christianity, Christ that is formed in you, travailing to bring forth a formed Christ. Oh, that travail... The devil knows that travail. He positions himself with one purpose. And so, you probably ought to reevaluate. Say, Lord, is this really what I want? But if you do want the Lord, somebody's got to leave. And I know I need to quit already, but I mean, in Vietnam, they had a guy that walked point. When you went anywhere, there was a man right up front, and then people walked like this. If you were at point, you were the first one to step on a mine, or you were the first one to catch a bullet. Somebody had to walk point. And then I forget the percentage, maybe some of you remember. But it was huge. The people who walked point were just, I mean, they, they didn't last. Three, I had like three months in the country. In the Vietnam, yeah, that's three months. You know. You know. Everybody didn't hold their position. Somebody had to take point. Somebody had to want that. Well, we look at that story, and we look at this story, and all this, and we say, oh, man, that's so heroic. You know, we read, we, we see Braveheart, and we say, I mean, movie after movie, if it's a guy movie, folks, he's a big hero that went against odds. Is that right or wrong? I, mean, I don't care. They just rearrange the story, but it's basically the same thing. You know, and the bad guy does evil thing to him that he doesn't deserve. Somehow he keeps going. Amen? And we love those movies, and we watch those, and we go, oh, and at the end of the movie, we just want to get up and go be a hero. And I was watching one. I don't remember which one it was. It was the one that God got shot down over Bosnia, and they were chasing him. Anybody remember that movie? It was the guy from Texas, the blonde guy. With the, you know, he was running through. You know, there's, what was it? Behind the enemy lines. Behind, oh, yeah. behind the enemy lines. And that's what we are in this planet. <laughs> you know, we're behind the enemy lines. And he was running, and the enemy was chasing him, and I was sitting there the whole time, time thinking, boy, everybody is just going, yeah, da, 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 and I'm doing the same thing. The enemy's chasing me. I'm running for all I've got to stay alive. One step ahead of the enemy before he totally destroys me. And I thought, in God's eyes, this is a whole lot more heroic than living through Bosnia. Well, that's you. Somebody. There always got to be somebody. Somewhere. There has to be not a leader, but somebody says, for Christ's sake in the gospel, for the glory of God, to the glory of the name of Jesus, I will spill my blood, I will be destroyed, I will have my name ruined, I will have my life ruined, I will have my finances ruined, I will have my family ruined, I will have everything ruined. And I, you know, I, need, I know I need to quit. But I'm going to tell you, this, this, I know I need to say some, finish some things too. My kids are under major attack constantly because I chose to go after the Lord. 
they get a little extra oomph there in their lives. It's true. They do. Too little extra oomph there. The enemy says, well, they've been around this all their life. Their love will get hold of this and be seed. Especially as they become seed, the enemy is going to do everything he can to stop that. Well, sorry girls that you're born in this family in that sense that you've gone through all the hell you've had to go through and more and more. This Jesus is worth it. This Jesus is worth it. And I know we all know that. I know I'm not. He is worth it. The hell my wife goes through. And, and the hell you've gone through. And yet I say, oh, God, it is worth it. I love him more than life, and I love him more than the blood in my veins, and I love him more than my name or reputation or anything else. I love him more than, than what I can do for him. And if just being drives the enemy crazy, then it must be that I'm coming closer to the image of Christ. Just existing makes the enemy furious. It must mean there's more Christ in me than I see. Darkness sees light and hates it. Amen? Yeah. Darkness sees, if you're in the light, you don't notice how much light's around you. But you know that darkness out there can look right over here and say, there's the light. Huh? Yeah. And so I'll take that as negative confirmation. Praise the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Jesus is so worthy. And, and no matter how dark your situation could ever get, there is this wonderful reality, and I'm closing with this, there's this wonderful reality that in that terrible place, they that sat in darkness saw a great light. And they that sat in the shadow of death, I forget what's the next part of it, really good. You know the scripture. They that sat in darkness saw a great light. It was a great light to them. And they that sat in the shadow of death just went, oh my God, God. This is more than just deliverance. This is life evermore. And you'll, you'll not waffle and go back and forth on a lot of things. You just don't. They don't even affect you anymore. You just stay with the Lord. You just stay steady. You just keep looking ahead. Sure, you're human. You get one thing you'll desire. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your precious, precious life. Thank you that you are light, a great light in a dark place. Oh, how great you truly are. Oh, what a shame we have to be in such darkness to realize such great light. Oh, Lord, that beings can't just be transformed today the way they used to be. When Pauls were knocked down on the road to Damascus and transformed. And Lord, people met you and their whole life turned around. Lord, may people in this room, with the, the hearing of tapes here, may they be transformed, not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of their mind. And may the armor of light brightly shine from them. Oh Lord, not physical armor, not even sword and, and shield. And, no Lord, the armor of light shines out from the inside of one who is filled with light. And may it be like armor against the darkness that would come in and attack and try to destroy. Lord, increase the armor of light to the people in this room, to the seed, to the seed, and to those to whom the seed has come. 
Father in Jesus' name.